Well, welcome everyone. I think we're going to start. It's just after 12. I know there's quite a few that still need to log in, but we're going to start anyway, just to make sure that we can end on time here. So welcome to our Wintertown Lunch and Learn. I'm just gonna get everything set up here. Okay. All right, so I'd first like to introduce myself. My name is Joni Hagen, and I've been the executive director of the Southeast Sport, Culture and Recreation District um, for about 12 years now, and I work out of our Weyburn office. And before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging that we have attendees joining us from across the Southeast whose work reaches lands covered by treaties two and four the traditional lands of the Cree, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Soto peoples, as well as homeland of the Métis. I love showing our About Us visual here. Just, I know some of you are quite familiar with the district, but others I know are sort of new to the district organization. And our About Us visual here basically tells our story of who we are what we do. We're one of seven sport, culture, and recreation districts here in the province of Saskatchewan, and we're all about building creative, active, healthy communities through sport, culture, and recreation. And these four bubbles here really tell our main priorities and our roles that we have. So the first bubble is we connect, and a lot of our peer networking sharing opportunities that we provide allows leaders to come together and learn from one another. We also develop leaders and volunteers. That's our second bubble there. So just like our webinar today, we offer a variety of different topics and webinars and workshops for community leaders to tap into. We also partner and collaborate with like-minded organizations. So anytime that we can work towards common goals and pool resources, we, we try to do that as well. And the last bubble here is we inform and inspire. And this is really important. I think it's probably one of our most important roles that we play is to make sure communities are aware of the resources and grants and funding and information that is available to them. And we also want to inspire. And that's what I hope to do today is to inspire you to embrace winter in your community and hopefully take back some, some great ideas. So many of you are probably wondering, what does it mean to be a winter town or what does it mean to be a winter city? And there is this growing movement of cities and towns who are studying and improving and welcoming winter opportunities. Many municipalities are creating strategies around the concept of planning their transportation systems, their infrastructure, their outdoor spaces, as well as their sport, culture, and recreation activities around the idea of creating a more vibrant and active community in all four seasons. And I love this quote from the Saskatoon Winter Strategy. They say, the outcome can be a more accessible, inclusive, active, prosperous, and livable community during the coldest months of the year. Please note, I will share the slides after the presentation today, and I have created a participant pack as well um, that has several additional links and articles and resources that will hopefully help you uh, embrace winter in your community. Feel free to take notes, but I will definitely be sending out an email as soon as the webinar is done so that you have that information. And you'll have to excuse me, I am just in a little bit of a midst of a cold, so um, hopefully <laughs> I won't have to sneeze or cough too much here as I move forward. So I do apologize for that in advance. All right, so our webinar agenda today, we only have 60 minutes. I thank you so much for joining us today. I'm hoping to leave you with some new ideas or maybe just some inspiration that might spark other thoughts and planning. These ideas may not all be new to you. You may have already tried some of these things in your community. There may be some of these ideas that will work for your community and perhaps some that are not relevant. It's really up to you to decide what activities match your priorities. 
I, however, feel all the examples I present today are applicable to rural or urban centers. Activities can certainly be downsized or revised to suit every community's needs. All right, so our agenda is here. So why become a winter town? We're gonna to talk about some challenges and opportunities. How do we do it? So that's the fun part. I'm gonna share some best practices and some examples of uh, activities. And hopefully I said 10 new ideas, but even if you take a couple of away, that would be great. And also leave you with some resources to take home in your back pocket. All right, so why become a winter town? So if you are wanting to go back to your municipality or your volunteer group and make a case or convince partners to be involved, the benefits are endless when it comes to embracing winter. And these were some of the main benefits cited from several strategies that I reviewed recently. And the big one is quality of life. And you can see here that the National Framework for Recreation in Canada, they state that people have an inherent need to connect with the natural world and that connecting with nature is associated with improved cognitive, mental and physical health. And so it really does, um, sort of contribute to that quality of life, that connection to nature. And you need to be outdoors, not only in the spring and summer, but also in the winter time. There are social and economic benefits. Residents will appreciate winter and see winter as an asset that offers great social and economic value to the community. So there's this opportunity to work with our cold climate instead of hiding from it. And then there's individual and community well-being that certainly links to quality of life. But as a winter town or a winter city, you can see enhanced accessibility and inclusiveness to be outside. You'll see reduced barriers to participation in the outdoors. More people like coming out to town public spaces, even on the darkest cold days of winter. And you'll see that decreased socialization sorry, social isolation. So just a question, and you can use your chat function for this if it does come up for you and does work for you. You can also use the Q&A, but the chat function should be working for you. You just have to make sure that it says everyone so that everyone can see your response. But if you want, if you have an idea or just a couple of words to type in the chat in terms of what do you think the winter challenges are in your community in terms of engaging the community or hosting winter activities? I mean, the obvious one is the weather. It can be very cold. And so it's really hard to plan activities uh, when you have those weather constraints. So I'll just give you a second and, and see if you have any ideas in terms of those challenges. working parents and limited daytime hours. Yeah, that's right. Uh, winter is a challenge in terms of the short days. By 5.30, it's dark. Anyone else have any challenges in terms of what they see? The weather, 100%. Yeah, Tina, that's a, definitely the snow, the wind chill. And Winchell, I mean, that's a, that's a good comment. And we're gonna talk about the importance of bringing warmth to the outdoors and you know, things like wind breaks um, to make it more you know, enjoyable. Yeah, Regan, biggest hurdle, I don't think. I don't like being cold, yes. And Regan, you know, that sort of uh, links back to people's attitudes. We sort of have this negative attitude about winter, especially when we're connected to the weather network all the time and checking on the weather. We have this attitude like, oh, we just don't want to be outside. And, and uh, there's sort of that negativity linked to the winter time and snow. Absolutely. So I'm just going to flip the table here and just ask you 
Um, what about winter opportunities? I mean, we know what the challenges are, but what is different in winter that we can embrace or take advantage of? Is there anything that comes to mind? One of the big things that I've seen in my research in terms of winter strategies is that there's this opportunity to embrace the snow and the ice. They're free resources. So although snow can be seen as a challenge, it could also be an opportunity for us. And it's a resource that we can use. Um, do you guys have any other opportunities that you see in terms of winter programming or engaging the community in the winter time? I'll just give you a second to respond to that. Oh yeah, Susan mentioned lack of sunshine. Yes, that definitely in terms of um, wanting to be outside, it's just sometimes so gloomy. That's that's a great challenge as well. And people travel out of town in the festive months for sure. Any positives in terms of what is different in winter that we can embrace? Any ideas for that? We all have this idea of hot chocolate and outdoor skating. <laughs> yes, for sure. Hot chocolate does bring people together. It's that warmth. <laughs> Picturesque views for hiking and snowshoeing. Yeah, so people do love the wintry landscape and people just love that. And it's very encouraging to be in the outdoors to see our winter landscape. Absolutely. I'm sure you guys will have other ideas and throw them forward here. Um, there are fewer events or there typically are fewer events in the winter time. So that could almost be an opportunity to engage the community because they're there's so many things happening in the spring and summer. So um, that's almost an opportunity for you as a community to engage uh, because there are fewer events. And you have an opportunity to be creative in a way that's different from summer events. Um, it allows us to play like a kid again. Kids love winter. They love making snow angels and catching snowflakes on their tongues. So it's almost having that sort of the opportunities to play like a kid again and for us adults to maybe think a little bit differently. When I was researching winter strategies, these were the top uh, consistent tips and actions communities implemented towards becoming a winter town. And I wanted to share these with you. And they're imperative to really start embracing that winter season and taking action. So the first one there is cultivating winter appreciation. So like I said before, there is this negative perception of winter and changing our mindset about winter is, is really needed. And it's about creating a winter town culture. And you may want to think about this uh, when you're doing your promotion of your outdoor activities or your winter activities and how you create messaging around your activities is really important to create that winter town culture. The second tip is building on existing assets. It doesn't mean you have to do all new things or build new things. The first step is to create an inventory of your winter assets. And again, create opportunities with what you have. You don't necessarily have to do something that's new or create something that's new. Community collaboration. So to truly become a winter town or city, we will need the municipality, volunteers, businesses, and community groups to come together to address winter challenges. It's really important to work together as a community. And then there's an opportunity or a tip to create a blizzard of ideas. So some things to consider is how can we enhance outdoor programming? What can we do to cultivate greater social connection between residents outside of hot chocolate? <laughs> and how do we activate and create inviting winter spaces? And we're going to talk about some of those examples later on. 
And it's always important to keep top of mind inclusion and accessibility. And then the last tip I wanted to leave you with is build a plan and take action. You know, becoming a vibrant town doesn't just happen overnight. It takes planning, collaboration, follow through and action. And if you do have a municipal community plan, um, you know, you might want to explore including a winter focus within that plan um, to make sure it is a part of your priorities and, and engage your community in feedback. Uh, I just wanted to share just some of this information from Winter City Edmonton. Obviously, Edmonton is a big city, but they've done some really great work in terms of becoming a winter city. And even just their cultural attitude shift towards winter has really changed since they've been working on their strategy. And I just wanted to share some of the quotes there. I won't go through all of them, but you'll have them um, as a part of your participant pack. And then they did a great job back in 2017. They did a lot of community input where they asked, you know, their residents what they currently do for outdoor activity and what they would like to do in the future. And of course, winter walking was one of their highest rated activities. And then, of course, skating on the outdoor rink and skating on, in the community rink were kind of rated the second highest. So it's just kind of interesting to see um, those types of things being done within larger municipalities and certainly something that you can do um, your community yourselves uh, and getting input from from your residents. So this is what I was talking about in terms of cultivating that winter appreciation. I wanted to show some very positive and exciting messaging around um, driving that positive mindset for winter. So this particular example was their winter walk day and it says open the door and go for it. Um, this carnival they promoted to grab your family and turn off your TV, come join us for 10 days of carnival fun or winter fun fest. I mean, winter fun fest alone makes you wanna join. Like who doesn't want to have fun music and food? That's just, that's awesome. So again, words matter. And that's just a whole part of that promotion piece and cultivating that appreciation for winter. Some other examples of messaging, um, you can see here on the left, they talk about cozy outdoor warming stations and warm festive drinks. So they're using that word, that catch word warm, <laughs> because I know somebody mentioned the cold, the cold is the challenge. So having that opportunity and bringing the warmth into the outdoors is definitely um, something that you may want to explore. And it's not just about promoting your activities. It's also about informing your residents. And I see this in a lot of municipal winter guides where they're really trying to um, educate their residents on how to stay active in winter, how to be creative in winter. So they're looking at things like plan ahead, stay hydrated, and how to dress in the outdoors or how to, how to dress for your events. Especially if you have newcomers to your community, that might be an important thing to really focus on is how to dress for a specific event. And, Adults always get colder than kids because kids are moving all the time. And but us adults, we tend to stand around. And so uh, we need to even dress a little bit warmer than the kids do. I did want to put a plug in about our winter town think tanks. These are free virtual brainstorming opportunities. We provide a written report with actions. And so it's just an opportunity to kickstart that planning. This was an example from the town of White City. They participated last year. They have winter as a focus within their community plan. And they had a new recreation director at the time. And so they used this as a way to sort of kickstart that planning for winter. It gave a little bit of direction and ideas for the recreation director to move forward with with the next couple of years. So it was a great opportunity just to come together and do some initial brainstorming. So certainly that's open to uh, any group, organization or community if they're wanting to do some, some brainstorming for winter. Okay, 
I'm going to get into the more exciting part here, you guys, and share a blizzard of ideas to consider and reflect on. And so I'm going to be talking about how to create inviting interspaces, so making it easier to play outside. That's one of the goals and a lot of the winter strategies that I've researched is make it easier to play outside or to be creative outside. And then I'll talk about some examples of outdoor programming and outdoor events. So a few different areas I'm going to give examples on include when it comes to creating inviting winter spaces is winter placemaking, activating and animating spaces. And I'm gonna be talking about lighting and warmth and family leisure time focus activities. This is really important. If any of you were a part of my programming webinar from last March, I kind of mentioned families that play together, stay together. And it's really important to not just look at scheduled and programmed activities, but also what can families and individuals tap into in their leisure time. So the definition of winter placemaking is a means to re-envision the ways that public spaces are created and used in winter in order to foster social connection, physical activity, and the many benefits of a vibrant public realm all year round. And so how do you do this? You first identify your community assets. And your assets, you have individual and cultural assets included in your local population. You have organizational assets. You also have physical assets, including built form, infrastructure and open spaces in a community that can be elevated through a program or event that seeks to have people occupy spaces and use infrastructure in new ways. I love this concept of LQC, lighter, quicker, cheaper. It's uh, a concept from the Winter Placemaking Guide, which I've included the link to that PDF. And I encourage you to check that guide out. It's got lots of ideas. And I am going to share here just a little excerpt from that guide. And, you know, again, it's you don't need new, expensive and sophisticated assets to do winter placemaking. So there's a couple of examples here, the pop-up winter fires and s'mores, which is a community in Wisconsin, their population of about 3,000. And they have s'more kits and pop-up fires to bring warmth and public life to the community during winter. The addition of a heating element and a family-friendly activity creates a lighter, quicker, cheaper way to engage in winter placemaking. And I also love the ice and smelt example. And that was a community from Maine with a population of 800. And they featured lighter, quicker, cheaper events like sidewalk stories that promote scavenger hunts throughout town, as well as an educational tour hosted by the local library. So just keep that in mind, the LQC concept, that it doesn't have to be new, expensive, or sophisticated things. <laughs> Regan's going to laugh at my hot chocolate socials here because that's what everybody thinks about in terms of getting warm in the outdoors. And a lot of uh, communities are using hot chocolate socials to bring people together to socialize and winter fire pits. Fire pits are huge in terms of bringing the warmth to the outdoors. And a question to ask yourselves too is, are you playing at night? And somebody mentioned that as well. I think Jenna, you mentioned, you know, the days are so short, it gets dark at 5.30. So there is an opportunity to engage your community at night. And so to keep that in mind when you're, when you're working on your winter activities. Now, fire pits, I, I think this is different in every community. There may be different bylaws or policies that you have in your municipality. Um, but this is just an example of the neighborhoods in Calgary. They ha actually have bookable uh, fire pits that you can access. Um, they have fire pits at community parks, but they're very specific and they outline what you can burn, um, bring your own equipment. So they list what equipment you should bring and then also include uh, safety uh, policies and instructions during your visit uh, with those fire pits and the parks and, and such. So just an example of, uh, you know, how you can sort of um, focus on fire pits to bring warmth to your community. 
Another tip and something to think about is, are you using your streets? You know, can you close off a street to give back to the people in your winter activities? And are you embracing temporary events? It doesn't always have to be something long-term. You can look at more short-term temporary things that you can offer. So some winter placemaking examples. Um, this Cozy Fest street sweaters is uh, an example of bringing colorful textiles into public spaces. So if you do have knitters and quilters in your community, this could be something um, that you can offer on a small or a larger scale. And this golden candlelight walk was kind of a neat idea in bringing warmth and light into a space in town where they engaged um, families and individuals to, to come and do a walk around town. And again, just another kind of created way, creative way to get people moving in the outdoors. Many communities are encouraging people to become artists in, in the winter time. I love this snow lantern concept. A snow lantern is a hollow cone built of snowballs into which a light is put. And it's very popular in Sweden and you don't need much, you just need snow. So this is an example of how to use snow as a resource. And so just like how we do snow forts and snowmen in Canada, we love to do that on snow days. Uh, the Swedes uh, love these snow lanterns. And I think it just creates such a pretty landscape. If you were to do it, you could do something with households or you could have this as a part of a, a family day event or some other festival if, if that's what you're doing. So there's some, some creative ways to, to implement that. And then also ice sculptures. There's a lot of communities, again, that use ice as a resource. And this example on the left, it just says, make a fancy ice lantern using a bucket. And they put a little tea light in the, in the ice. So it's just kind of neat how you can, you know, use ice sculptures or snow as, as a resource uh, in your winter activities. Um, some other sort of, um, examples of winter placemaking. I love this electric forest example uh, and it has these visually striking colorful noodles arranged in groves and it creates this sort of cozy microclimate for gathering on dark days and cold nights and they've used LED lights and music um, to make it a very welcoming and warm um, place to come together. And of course, this is another example of winter yarn bombing, where um, they're activating trees by employing local quilters and knitters to yarn bomb the dormant trees in the community. And then they also have some drive-in noodles as well. So bringing that color to the landscape as well is, is really important. I love this concept of front yards in bloom. So instead of communities in bloom, and I know many of you communities um, participate in the communities in bloom program. And so this is just kind of a, a neat way to engage households, or it could be even a broader community project where maybe the school or the library, the rink, or even businesses could be in, engaged in this type of, you know, competition where they winterscape their front yards. And uh, it's an opportunity for family and friends to come together to create snow sculptures or place ornaments on trees or build snow, snow creatures. So it's kind of a, a cool, cool little contest that you could create within your community. So winter placemaking tip, I talked about winter warmth and Again, you guys made it very clear that the cold is very much a challenge. And so warmth in winter is normally found indoors, but bringing the heat to the outdoors can be the key to getting folks to enjoy the elements. And that's why I talked a little bit about fire pits it's because they're just a very low cost way to bring warmth to the outdoors. This example from Winnipeg, the warming huts, that's a pretty sophisticated uh, warming hut in terms of, um, our communities and, uh, but you know, it gives you an example of 
what, what you could potentially do to uh, bring warmth to a space. And the other tip for winter placemaking is lighting. So how can you incorporate lighting into your spaces? Um, this little picture here is from Cypress Hills and they have these lighting waves along a trail. And so people are able to access the trail in the dark. So, you know, it gets dark at 5.30, so they can go out and do their snowshoeing or cross country skiing, even in the dark. And so, and that's something to consider, you know, how can lighting enhance the nighttime identity of a winter town? And how can creative lighting shape vibrant social towns and desirable places after dark? Because that's our reality in winter, it's especially December, January, it's, it's quite dark most of the time. <laughs> so a couple of other examples um, to be strategic with lighting. Um, so these are some examples of parks and trails where lighting has been used. And then there's an example fire pit uh, downtown here where they've also used LED cubes to, to bring more light to the space. Okay, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about leisure time activities. So um, having spaces and activities available for families to do not and not programmed or scheduled. These are just things people can do at their leisure. Everyone's always running with hockey or dance, um, those scheduled um, activities. So it is great to be able to offer opportunities. And this came up lots in the think tank with the town of White City, they talked about how everybody's so busy, but how can we just provide spaces, welcoming spaces for individuals or families to come and just relax or just to enjoy the outdoors. So one example is to offer neighborhood scavenger hunts to get people moving outdoors on their own time. So there's a couple of examples there. This is kind of a neat idea, gnomes on the trail. There's three different sort of ways or examples here that communities have done that gnome takeover. So you place gnomes in your community park or around town. It's another way to engage families to walk around town and to be outdoors on their leisure. And you can make a contest or a game out of it with prizes, or you can incorporate social media and have them do selfies. And there's almost two opportunities here because you could have a gnomes art project where you make the gnomes and then use them to display them around town. So geocaching, um, it's an outdoor recreational activity in which GPS devices are used and there's containers that are hid and these are called geocaches or caches and they're hid at specific locations. So Operation Reindeer is kind of an example of a geocaching style event. If any of you uh, aren't familiar with geocaching, definitely uh, I will have some links in the participant pack if you wanna learn a little bit more about them and find out uh, more about that, that type of activity. There will be some more information there. Um, snowman building contest. So, you know, building a snowman is probably one of the most traditional um, activities that, that we do in the winter time. And um, of course you could have a contest and run it from a specific period and have different categories. In this specific example, they've done best snow creature, tallest snowman. Um, there's lots of opportunities there to, to have a snowman building contest. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about outdoor spaces. So the ODR, the outdoor rink, definitely a barrier-free activity for outdoor leisure. And there's definitely some challenges around outdoor rinks, you know, the cold. Sometimes we have warm-up shacks that can get vandalized. Um, they always come with unique issues, but the the benefits are definitely there in giving youth a positive environment at no cost to play. And it can also serve as a great centerpiece for community celebrations. And there are some tips in terms of being successful with your outdoor rink. 
thick ice is best, especially in southern Saskatchewan. We sometimes have fluctuating temperatures in the winter time. So the thicker the ice, the, the easier it is going to be to maintain. Using lots of signage, having that windbreak if you don't have a warm up shack. I know somebody mentioned the wind and the wind chills. So having, having that in place makes the, the outdoor rink more successful. I wanted to share Chrono's outdoor rink project because they've done such a good job in telling their story of what they've done. And they're just a little hamlet just outside of Regina. And their Facebook page, just if you want to take a scroll through it um, after the session, they've done a great job in showing how they've used their local trades people, how they've confirmed sponsorships um, for the project. Um, just a great learning opportunity to see what it takes to put a, an outdoor rink uh, in your community. So I'll make sure that, that you get that link in your participant pack. I love this. Be a flood hero. I shared this last, my last webinar too, and I love this. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a flood hero? It's, it's a direct, direct ask. And, and it's very detailed as to what the job is and the commitment. You know, we're always looking for volunteers to support programming. And I thought this was a very clever marketing campaign to recruit volunteers. And I love the questions they asked, very detailed. And what a, what a positive way to recruit volunteers in your community. You know, be a flood hero, very cool. So many communities um, are creating these skating paths and skateways. Um, and skate paths provide a unique experience for skaters. It's this long ribbon of ice that can be a relaxed recreational experience, sort of different from the traditional rectangle rink. Mooseman is a great local example. I have provided and a, uh, a YouTube video link so that you can check it out if you want to learn more. And we are seeing more and more of these ice trails to skate on. They're becoming very popular. And in some communities, they're being used as commuter trails as well. So very neat to see, to see those skate trails. So tobogganing and sledding, of course, are family fun, leisure time focus activities. Talk about creating accessible outdoor spaces to play. I think the big thing here is just the risk management and bylaws and policies that your municipality would have in place um, for this type of activity. We are seeing a lot of municipalities just really focus on promoting sledding safety tips. We're seeing that lots, just making sure that the public knows what the rules are, what the bylaws are, and just informing them of how to be safe when sledding. Croca curl. Um, so this is a combination of crocodile and curling. And, you know, all of these spaces I'm talking about really provide residents uh, an opportunity to have access to the outdoors in their own leisure time. And, you know, if you are exploring sort of these new outdoor spaces, my tip would be to take the time to research and talk to other communities that have them. Um, they can tell you firsthand their experience, you know, maybe things to avoid, things to make sure that you do um, so that you can be successful in creating these spaces in your own community. Crook and Curl, I mean, there are small communities like Winthors that are creating these awesome outdoor spaces. And then there's cities like Weyburn who um, are putting them in place as well. So it's, it's just another opportunity to, and a curling is such a, a tradition for many communities as well. So it's a, a great opportunity to get, again, curling in the outdoors. Winter trails, so communities are, you know, creating winter trails so that they can provide opportunities for snowshoeing and cross country skiing. This was just an example from the Whitewood Winter Trails. They actually have some drone footage, some video on their Facebook page. So if you're wanting to kind of learn more about 
their trails and what they have done in their community, they would be a good example to, to tap into. Just uh, a couple things about bringing art to the outdoors. Uh, art installations, these can be temporary or permanent. I, I needed to comment on the Estevan Art Gallery. They partnered with the Woodlawn Regional Park for the past few years, and they've engaged artists in these outdoor installations within the regional park. Very cool partnership. And it can just show you, you know, what's kind of evolved from the pandemic and, and COVID and forcing us outside more. And so these types of partnerships have kind of evolved um, from the pandemic. And so it's great to see that type of collaboration happening. So there's lots of opportunity for other artist community collaboration projects to explore. I just love this example of this local library that did snow painting. And I think these huge frozen balloons, they look like these pretty marbles and they can just act as kind of a sort of a short term installation in, in any space. They're, and they're so pretty um, and bring color to the winter landscapes. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for, you know, partnering with your local artists to bring those types of activities and projects to the community. I know many of you do story walks in the summer, but there are communities that are doing winter story walks. These are free family friendly engagement activities you can do within your own parks and trails. And I would encourage you to talk to your local library. They would be a fantastic partner to engage with to bring a story walk to your park or your trail or even a downtown space. Many municipalities and groups are purchasing equipment for kits for families to access for leisure activity. These are some examples of loan kits from local communities, as well as some more urban centers across Canada. Uh, many communities are creating snowshoe loaner programs. And I think it's because not many people have snowshoes. And so they are trying to make that equipment uh, accessible to to residents so that they can take part in their trails and parks. Uh, the Weyburn Oil Women uh, Association, they did a very unique loan kit program uh, called their Lending Sled Shed. And um, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. And so they had the sled shed right at the top of the toboggan hill so that anybody could access a sled to you know, enjoy the, the sledding hill. So, that was a really unique um, project as well that, we're, that we've seen. I just wanted to share this because I, I thought it was kind of unique, a sports club in a box. I mean, you could have an arts uh, box as well, um, but I, I just thought it was kind of unique. I mean, there are some risk in terms of, you know, things getting maybe stolen, um, maybe there's ways around that, but I, I just thought this was kind of a unique way to offer equipment to remove those barriers in the community. And uh, obviously this could be an all seasons opportunity as well, not just winter. Don't forget to use your regional parks. I, I, I love this example because I think we always think of regional parks as just a summer time space. It, it is an existing asset that can help embrace winter activity. And that's exactly what the Mooseman and District Regional Park did. Um, they did a winter wonderland this past January, and that was their goal. They, they wanted to uh, engage their residents into the park and, and do some cool activities. You'll see their hot chocolate again, Regan. <laughs> and so, uh, and s'mores and skating on the lake. So there's lots of opportunities to use our regional parks in the winter time. Uh, so don't forget them, they're, they're there and they're a huge asset for us. Okay, so just a few things around outdoor programming. So some sports, recreation and arts activities I wanted to share. Um, yes, we are bringing fitness classes to the outdoors and it is called Snoga, a mix of yoga and snow. And there's a great example from Montreal that uh, I wanted to show in a YouTube 
uh, link. Um, but I figured with the time frame I had, I didn't have time to show it, but I have it included in the participant pack. So I do encourage you to take a look at the Montreal example. It's, it's really cool how they do yoga in the snow, snoga. And this particular example, they mixed snowshoeing in as well. So if you have some yogis in your community, that might be something to, to explore. I did share this at uh, my programming webinar last year, just looking at family fun at the rink. And this can be at your outdoor rink or your indoor rink, you know, looking at other ideas instead of just a regular public skate, pioneer stick and puck, having a family stick and puck, a one world skate. So if you have newcomers in the community, this might be a great way to host a multicultural type event glow curling and skating and come throw rocks at houses if you have a curling rink um, where you can offer personalized instruction from experienced curlers. I love the concept of offering a variety of different activities um, as part of an event. You'll see this chili willy cook-off, but it's not just a, a chili cook-off. They've also incorporated a family skate and live music. So there's opportunity to engage different demographics by hosting several different activities. And they only hosted that for three hours. It was just 11 to two. It wasn't a, a long day event, um, which always helps in terms of, you know, your volunteer capacity. Everybody's uh, really struggling to engage volunteers, especially now post COVID. Um, so offering just short events, you know, on a Sunday afternoon can be, can be very successful. I wanted to share this uh, little example about Get Outside Kids Club. This is quite um, a large program that Nature Regina um, offers, and they have these major partners. But I thought this was applicable to any community to do, whether it's a school or a library, um, to offer a little kids club um, to get outside. And again, just allowing kids to connect to nature and do snowshoeing and orienteering, lots of opportunities there if you have some, a group of kids that want to be outdoors or that you have some leaders that you wanna engage um, to create a kids club in the winter time. Don't forget about walking. There's opportunities to host winter walk days and many municipalities are focusing on communicating winter walking safety tips. So walking is the easiest form of movement and exercise. And, and I know a lot of you promote walking as an indoor activity. And so um, there is opportunities to promote, you know, walking outside still and, and getting people to, um, think differently about that and, and offer some safety tips. So again, because we have such short days, one of the tips is to make the most of our winter darkness and play at night. And this was an example that I wanted to share was the snowshoe events. They, the first one here is a full moon snowshoe and the second one is a Marsh by Moonlight snowshoe series. And what they've done is they provided an opportunity, I think one even used a guide, a volunteer guide, where uh, they have a they snowshoe somewhere, they have a fire roast, roast a smoky, and then have some hot chocolate again. <laughs> and they watch the sunset and then when it's dark, they make their way back to their vehicles. So again, just another way to embrace the darkness during the winter time. If you're looking for snowshoe resources, I did want to put a plug in about the Sask Wildlife Federation. They have a, uh, the Bigfoot Snowshoe Loan and Southeast Regional Library also has a snowshoe kit, I believe. So if you have a library in your community, they may have access to that kit. So you can sort of reach out to your library about their snowshoe kits. But, uh, Sask Wildlife Federation has a snowshoe loan program as well. So I did want to share just a few sports specific things that uh, you might not be aware of. So cross country, uh, cross country Saskatchewan, losing my words there, 
Um, they do have a skill development program and they have a development grant. So if you're wanting to introduce cross country skiing to your community, this would be a great organization to tap into um, for those resources. I think we always think about hockey, but we don't often think about broomball. And this is a great sport and recreational activity to introduce to your community. So if you're wanting to um, access a loaner kit for the equipment and you want to sort of have a try it day, maybe as part of your family day event, uh, Saskatchewan Broomball definitely would have some resources there for you. Okay, so I think I'm doing okay for time. I think it's about 10 to 1. I just have a few more slides here to share in terms of outdoor events. So just some ideas around celebrations and parties and festivals and competitions. I know many Southeast communities offer family day events in February. And so the, the ideas are endless in terms of uh, what to offer during your family day events, but these were just some examples of activities. Um, this one community did snow painting, snow dodgeball, potato sack races, and a scavenger hunt. Uh, I thought this was kind of cool to have a hockey accuracy shot competition. They also offered live entertainment. And then this little uh, example on the left, the light up on Brown Road, they had all these performances. They brought choirs in and different performances, which was kind of a cool, cool thing to offer. Um, if any of you are Harry Potter fans and know what Quidditch is, it's uh, quad ball. Apparently that can be played outdoors as well. I'm not a Harry Potter fan, so I don't really know much about that, but I see it's quite uh, popular in many communities, so wanted to share that. Some museum events. I, I really liked this Deck the Pond, where they created these nature-friendly ornaments, and then they hung them along a local trail and just kind of a free family friendly event to get families out to the museum. Uh, winter nights, I thought this was kind of cool too, where a local museum hosted social festive nights every Thursday during the month of December to get people out together. And I guess you could, you know, incorporate some different activities into that as well. Uh, the snowflake, seek and find. I thought that was kind of a neat idea. Um, you could do that indoors or outdoors where you're kind of, you know, giving people something to sort of seek and find um, within the museum or maybe outside the museum. This is a super neat example of how a community engaged and collaborated with their local Indigenous band. They shared the Indigenous language in their carnival promotions. And I thought this was a great reconciliation action and tells that heritage story of their community. And they also included storytelling as one of their carnival activities. So just a reminder that there are those potential partnerships to explore um, with our Indigenous communities as well um, to, to explore those. Tournaments and competitions, uh, you know, activities and sports like ultimate frisbee, snow pitch, and disc golf can also be played in the snow. I didn't know that, uh, but there are many communities that are offering snow disc golf. And so I did find a couple of YouTube videos and provided those links. I mean, obviously it probably depends if your disc golf course is accessible during the winter. Um, but obviously, if that's something that you want to explore, um, there are communities that are doing that. So that was kind of neat. Again, in terms of festivals, I thought this was a great example of a snowman and ice building festival. I love this little photo of all the little mini snowmen. Um, what a, a cool family or kid friendly activity to do during an event. And again, just another example of utilizing snow as an asset um, in our winter activities.
this is another example of a festival event type activity. So outdoor art competition that sparks creativity and outdoor activity. They place artwork throughout the downtown, bringing people into and around businesses to judge the works. And then they also use lighting and fire pits for warmth. So people, you know, aren't scared of the cold that they'll come in and, and do their judging and enjoy the art. So I thought that was kind of a neat, neat activity to bring art into the outdoors. If you are hosting an event or festival, um, it's important to start small, make sure there is buy-in or desire for a larger scale festival if that's what you're working towards and slowly build up your volunteer force to do a festival. I'm not gonna get into this in any detail, but I did want to just uh, leave this as a resource if you're wanting to you know, have a better understanding of events versus festivals. And I am leaving you a link to a great manual that kind of explains the difference of those activities. I love this, this came from Winter City Edmonton and they had some examples of celebrations and party ideas. Um, they list here toboggan party, wildlife watching, host a winter Olympic games, a snowball fight. Well, that could be <laughs> a little risky perhaps. Uh, again, just using snow as a resource, you know, a snow fort building. And again, it probably depends on if it's a year, if we have snow, there's many years where we have, do have lots of snow and then there's years we don't. Uh, hosting a snowshoe party. I love this little sparklers uh, example. Try writing with them or drawing pictures in the air as someone takes a photo. See if you can capture works of sparkly art. I thought that was really cool. And you could actually do some sort of maybe uh, outdoor photography uh, event or um, sort of workshop um, with, I know a lot of communities are doing iPhone photography um, clinics or workshops. And so that might be kind of something neat to do on its own or um, to do as a part of a different event as well. Okay, so I'm running out of time here. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with some helpful resources. I do want to remind you that we have uh, our Grow Your Community grant. If you haven't applied yet this year, um, that's available for winter programming and events. There is also funding available through Sask Outdoors. They have a grant as well as the Saskatchewan Parks and Recreation Association. They have their grants guide, which does have an outdoors nature area. So if you are looking for funding, that's a great resource to tap into. And again, we have our Wintertown think tanks. If you're wanting to host a think tank, certainly reach out to me and I will make sure that I share our participant pack. You guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you logging in. I will ask you to to please complete our webinar survey. Uh, I like to get feedback for myself to know, you know, if the content was valuable for the participants. I also, we really depend on feedback in terms of the funding that we receive um, to deliver these types of services. So it's really important that we get your feedback. And um, so I just encourage you to do that for us. Have a very happy winter. Call me anytime if you need anything and, uh, and happy holidays to you as well. I hope everyone has a chance to enjoy the outdoors this winter and during the holidays. Thanks again and take care.